It is a huge month for Pathfinder and a huge month for us. The new remastered core rulebooks are out now and I'll be making a little video soon to give you my hot takes on them and to give you a recommendation for a new starter adventure to sink your teeth into Pathfinder. But today we are taking a look at the Pathfinder Battles minis for Fists of the Ruby Phoenix. This is one of the most popular APs Pathfinder has had yet. If you want to play a madcap anime style adventure, this is the one for you. It goes from levels 10 to 20, so it's high level stuff. There are five mini sets for Ruby Phoenix, and today we are taking a look at one called Martial Arts Masters. We'll go through the minis, and then we'll be joined by the author of the third book of the AP, King of the Mountain, Paizo senior designer, James Case. But two other announcements first. We have a brand new Pathfinder supplement that just launched, written by Grady, Rare Ancestries Ifrit. Play an actual fire genie in your Pathfinder games. It was developed to accompany the lore in Rage of Elements, and it is balanced and fully compatible with the remastered GM Core and Player Core books. Grady is both an official Pathfinder freelancer and a Pathfinder Infinite Master, so you are in good hands. You can check it out now in the link in the corner of your screen or in the doohickey down below. And we're having our first ever sale of our Cobalt plushies. You can get 20% off everything you order right now, including our plushies, our Goblin Gold coin, and our new t-shirts. We have holiday shirts, new Cobalt shirts, and more. Just use the coupon code GOBOGOBLIN at checkout for that 20% off. Now let's take a look at our martial arts masters from Fists of the Ruby Phoenix. Today's video is brought to you by Hitpoint Press. The deck of many animated 5e reference cards can bring even more magic to your games, and they make fantastic gifts. Get animated spell cards, condition cards, or townsfolk NPCs. You can even get in-game items like the deck of illusions and the deck of many things. Get huge discounts on everything Hitpoint Press during their Black Friday sale going on now. Use our links in the corner or in the doohickey down below. In this adventure, the PCs travel to Tianjia to participate in a world-famous martial arts tournament. And just like when Formula One visits Las Vegas, not everyone is happy about it. Tamikan, an ancient and grumpy Kangamoto, a sort of primeval dragon, doesn't particularly like all this riffraff traipsing over his lawn and will likely initiate a battle with the PCs in Book One. This fellow is a Yeti monk. And in book three, your PCs will enter into a friendly sparring session with two of these fellas, so I hope you have another Yeti mini handy, as well as two human monks. The Yetis are able to manifest a snowfall inside which they can hide and pounce from. Our final large mini in the set is Koto Zakora, a powerful and loyal enforcer on Danger Island, a fierce combatant, and a unique Onidashi Imperial Blooded Sorcerer. An Onidashi, also known as an Ogre Mage, is an Oni that resembles an Ogre. She's armed with powerful melee attacks and AoE spells like Fireball and Lightning Bolt, so when the PCs encounter her in Book 1, it is going to be quite a fight. Next up, let's take a look at Jen Hei, a phantom knight who will challenge the PCs in Book 3. When the fight begins, her faithful old steed, Cloud Splitter, will coalesce and join her in the body of a Kareen. There is a D&D mini of a Kareen in the Fangs and Talons set. This battle is made even more interesting by the fact that the ground here is just littered with so-called battle echoes, which are essentially legendary items that can be used by either the PCs or Jen Hei in the battle. This is Yarika Biting Rose, a lawful good human spiritualist leader, and the person instrumental in setting up the fight with Jen Hei in Book 3. She also has perhaps the most questionable fashion sense in all of Tianjia. Yarika doesn't have a stat block, and I don't believe she should enter combat during this adventure, so it is an interesting inclusion into the set. It could be used as a PC mini, though. This Tengu in need of an orthodontist is Takatora, who appears in all three books of the adventure and eventually undergoes a transformation into this, their Dai Tengu form. They're a part of the fighting group known as Tino's Toughest, and they'll be facing off against the PCs more than once over the course of the adventure, which gives you the chance to show the team's abilities at lower and higher levels, which is a lot of fun. Finally, we have Su Takna, forgive my pronunciation, a white-haired witch and a member of the Light Keepers, another antagonistic fighting group. She possesses powerful spatial control and combat skills and becomes even more powerful when she's within the Glass Lighthouse in Book 3 of the Adventure. 
In a set of cool minis, this is definitely one of the most interesting. That thing on her upper arm there is her familiar, an elephant hawk moth named Yan So. So this set has a mixture of creatures that you'll encounter mainly in books one and three. And if you're like me and you're thinking, hey, wouldn't it be nice if, let's say, we had a box of minis for each fighting party or a box for the monsters and NPCs from each book, then you will be happy to hear that Paizo's mini guru, Mark Moreland, has agreed to come back on the Gallant Goblin next week to explain how these boxes were put together, so stay tuned for that. Now this mini set here, Martial Arts Masters, is a very cool, if very specific set of minis. You'd have to be pretty creative to use these minis outside of the Ruby Phoenix Adventure, but the stat blocks are available on the Archives of Nethys website for free if you do want to do that. And now allow me to welcome to the Gallant Goblin, Pathfinder Senior Designer, James Case. James, thanks so much for joining me today. How's it going? Hi, how are you? I think you probably had a very busy couple of weeks here. Y'all finally have GM Core and Player Core out the door. I know it's convention season still. I was just wondering, how you holding up so far? Uh, it's good, you know, with the, the kind of way that the production cycles work, you know, we, uh, at the time of recording this, the player core and GM core have just come out. Um, but, you know, we had shipped those a couple months ago. So now we're, we're further into the future. We have more things coming out, but uh, it's great to get to the point where, you know, the books are starting to hit shelves and fly off shelves apparently, which is great to hear. Um, I know some of us were kind of looking at some of the game stores around this past weekend, and it seems like especially like people really like those Wayne Reynolds sketches, which is cool. Um, but yeah, it's really great. You know, this was very much an all hands on deck project, and it's cool to have the content be live and people looking them over and all that kind of thing. So that's great. There's so much new stuff in here, so many cool little changes. I was wondering if you had any favorite little bit of lore or change in here that was really exciting to you and that you're looking forward to using in your games and either one of the books. Yeah, um, so we remastered a lot of the classes and put a lot of quality of life stuff in there, but I know a lot of people have seen those. Uh, one thing that's kind of small that I really like is that um, items tend to have unique names for their activations now, which I think is just kind of a, a cool little thing. It adds some flavor to it. Uh, and I also really like a thing that I think Eleanor Farron really spearheaded with um, in the kind of Age of Lost Omens section, going through each one of our meta regions, it'll give you some examples of like what kind of adventures can be there. Like, you know, the High Sea Shackles region, that's, you know, we just say like, here's where your pirates and swashbucklers are. And I think it's just a really good way to find, uh, to kind of just like find the kind of tone that might fit the kind of game you're you're looking for. Um, and all that kind of stuff, in addition to, you know, kind of the bigger, the bigger changes that I know people have picked up on, like the changes to Cleric or Witch or Druid. Right. That's a great idea, too. And it kind of leads us into Fist of the Ruby Phoenix. And I know it has been a hot minute since you've probably <laughs> laid your eyes on this adventure because this came out a while ago. And of course, with your timelines, you're working on it well before that. But how would you, who, what kind of groups would you recommend this adventure to? Of course, it's a high level adventure, so probably more advanced groups. But like if a group is looking for blank, this would be a good adventure for them. What do you think? Uh, this is a high octane shonen battle tournament. Uh, it is pretty unabashedly like your just anime tournament arc kind of stuff going on. It's very high level. It's like high level. It's very high octane. Um, it's very bombastic. This is not a subtle AP by any means. This is one where, you know, you begin in one of the largest martial arts tournaments in one of the largest cities uh, on the planet meeting people from all over who each have, you know, they're from all over the globe. They're competing for this like magical artifact. And then as with all good tournaments, uh, some things start to kind of go off the rails a little bit and you have to deal with the escalating consequences of that. So yeah, um, high, just high stakes action. That's, this one is uh, three chapters of just a lot of combat, a lot of uh, meeting people from all over the world, a lot of teamwork, that kind of thing. As I was kind of reading through it to get ready to talk to you, 
I was trying to pick out some of the themes of the adventure. And it seemed to me that, you know, I haven't read everything word for word, so you kind of jump in and correct me, but I was seeing themes of the you know, competition, of course, of honor, but there was a lot of self-discovery and people kind of changing over the course of the three books. Some of the NPCs uh, you will see in all three books. And I was wondering, does that sound about right? And some of the characters that are in this mini set that we're talking about today, to me, seem to reflect that. And I was wondering what your perspective was of that. Yeah, um, I think that, you know, it, there are a lot of fights. It's a tournament, obviously. Combat is really big, but also one of the pieces that tends to come up in these types of stories a lot is very much like cooperation. Uh, you know, it's the idea of like bettering yourself through competition with other people. You know, most of the other teams, uh, they're in it for various reasons. You know, one is a team from the lands of the Linorm King, and they're trying to kind of themselves up there. One is uh, one of the finalist teams is from the Magambia and they are on what is essentially a very high stakes kind of uh, field, not really a field trip, but, you know, a and uh, sort of that sort of uh, expedition or uh, that sort of thing. So everyone's coming at it with their own motives, but uh, there is very much a theme of like friendly competition of forming connections uh, through you know, in the same way you would for any other sport or any other competitive thing. And that's the thing we get to kind of lay the foundation for in the first book uh, and kind of um, by the third book, which was the one that I wrote, um, it was really nice because these characters had appeared in the first two books already. And so we could kind of um, spend some time with you meeting these other teams, like not just on, you know, in the middle of the arena, but kind of you're out there in the world and you're trying to help each other fulfill your goals. Uh, and, you know, like also anything there. We also have some ways where the people you've helped kind of along the journey might come back and support you in one way, shape or form. Um, so I really like that idea of kind of like, yeah, sure, so we're all here to win, but, you know, it's no hard feelings. We just we want the best person to win. And if I don't win now, then that's just uh, that just means I have to train harder in the next 10 years before the next tournament. So. Yeah, absolutely. And there's some cool characters in this little mini set we're talking about today. Uh, Takatora stood out to me. You've got one of the, the light keepers in this set. Uh, and I'm going to butcher all the names, obviously, but uh, <laughs> Suf Takwa, I don't know. I was wondering if you had some insight on some of those characters or the light keepers in general, and maybe even some advice for people who may be wanting to role play these characters in their games. Yeah. Um... So the light keepers are, I'm gonna try and keep the spoilers kind of light, but it's a little inevitable since we're kind of looking at the final chapter. Um, the light keepers are kind of your main, uh, one of the rival teams and they are probably the uh, meanest of them. They very much, uh, they kind of are jerks in, in a way that the rest of them aren't. Um, you fight them several times and so this is kind of like in their most powerful forms. Uh, Takno is one of the leaders and we really pulled on this kind of like the white haired witch type of archetype that's shown up in a lot of places. So uh, by the time you are seeing them at the end, they are very much just kind of out for themselves. Um, and where some of the other teams that you may fight, like Takatora, um, when you fight their party, you know, they were very used to working together. So they have abilities that allow them to kind of team up on their side, but the light keepers don't have that. Instead, they have a kind of grabbing power for themselves sort of mechanic, um, just to kind of underscore that a little bit in their in their mechanics there. Yeah, and one of the other, well, probably the biggest bad of the entire adventure campaign is Sindara. And Sindara doesn't have a mini in this set, but we do have a couple of Sindara minis throughout this yeah. little mini collection. And as the author of the final book, you really got to sculpt this character, pun fully intended. And See I wondered you if, you had some, <laughs> <laughs> if you had some insights on him as a bad guy, making sure that, you know, uh, an adventure is often defined by how good the bad guy is. And so some insight on Sindara and some insight on how to develop him as a villain in this campaign. Yeah, I would say that um, probably the Light Keepers are kind of the main villains for some of the, for the first couple arcs, as it were. Um, but in the third book, Sindara is, you kind of find out the, the real orchestrator here. And um, Sindara's biggest theme that I kind of kept coming back to is a sort of inferiority complex, basically. Um, he was kind of a rival with Hao Jin, uh, who is, you know, one of the most powerful people in our setting, you know, she's endlessly reincarnating. She has amassed all of these 
artifacts. She has this demiplane that she uses kind of as a museum. And uh, Sindara is basically the teacher who got eclipsed by the student in some ways and is very resentful about it. Um, uh, some other stuff kind of goes down there as well, but um, a lot of what happens is him kind of, you know, rather than the thing that you would see in a, in, you know, in a tournament arc where, you know, the protagonist maybe beats the villain at the end, but then, you know, they become friends because they fought and it's like, okay, well, I have to try harder and, you know, I have to get better. He's like, well, I have to make everybody else suffer in that kind of way. So he's kind of that, that kind of in, not not learning the lesson and instead just deciding to be a villain about it. Um, and there are some like kind of flashbacks there, which, uh, you know, might be things that you, if you're, if your players are interested in the character, might be things you could kind of scatter around uh, the story, um, especially since, you know, these two characters are both extremely long lived, you know, how Jin uh, resurrects many times. He's, uh, um, you know, he's an extra planar character, so he's immortal, right? Um, and there's many ways in which they could have kind of shaped the history of things. Yeah, and as far as like kind of getting into the the theme of the, the of the adventure and just the the vibe of it, I was wondering if you had any recommendations for maybe movies or books or TV shows that inspired you that you were listening to or watching when you were writing this that might help a group or a GM at least kind of get into the mood for this adventure. Um. Okay. Well, battle anime in general, very much the same thing there. Uh, obviously, uh, I'm partial to the dark tournament art of Yu Yu Hakusho. I think it's fantastic. Um, but this last one also has a bit more of an kind of an RPG feel in the sort of like more very like Final Fantasy -y sort of sense because you're no longer, um, you know, in the first book you are. It takes place entirely on Bonmu, which is the island where the qualifiers take place, and then the second book takes place entirely in Goko, which is the big metropolis of Tiansha. And this one kind of spans across the mountains. Uh, you know, you're in an airship, you are going around to all these fantastic areas. And so I would say that those like, kind of that era of JRPGs is a good touch point uh, right there as well. That's cool. Uh, oh, it's been a while since I played a Final Fantasy game. I'd love to get back <laughs> into that. Uh, and we also have the new Tianja books coming out next year. And I, I imagine that when those come out, we're going to see a resurgence of interest in this adventure path. And I was wondering if you had some thoughts on how folks might use those two books. We're getting a world guide, we're getting a player character yeah. guide. Uh, how you could incorporate those into making this adventure maybe even more flavorful, more uh, immersive in their games, at their tables. Yeah, um, certainly the, the Tensha World Guide will give a lot of background for the continent, um, some new deities as well. Uh, and, you know, we knew we wanted to do Tansha at some point, and Ruby Phoenix is a very, you know, it's a very tropey uh, adventure on purpose, um, but we also wanted to tie in, you know, folklore, tie in actual stories uh, into there as well. So, um, you know, a lot of the monsters you see there are ones that show up in, you know, various myths from across Asia. Um, and in fact, some of the monsters that are in the Tiansha World Guide are ones that we kind of originally started playing with in Ruby Phoenix. So there's a nice little back and forth there. Um, certainly the second book especially, which takes place entirely in Goka. Goka has a large gazetteer in the World Guide where you can learn all, all you really want to know about this giant city with a lot going on in it. Um, and, uh, you know, the section that takes place in my book, uh, the parts that take place in Tiansha, Actually, in the World Guide, we do talk a little bit about how the outcome of the Ruby of this Ruby Phoenix tournament might have altered that region specifically. So it's a nice little bit there where, like, you know, we can build in some of the some of the ways in which the PCs shape the world into the living canon there as well. And then, of course, when the character guide comes out, uh, I don't think you you know we haven't said everything about what's coming in that book, but I really don't think it's a surprise to say that there are some more sections in martial arts or there are some ways to harness divine magic that would be uh, that would be just as good as your character options here and maybe if you want to delve into really using some of those new fighting styles uh, as you pick up this adventure. That's awesome. And the current adventure path is taking place in Tianja. That's going on right now, a season, season mm -hmm. of ghosts. And that adventure goes from one to, I don't know, maybe 12, 13. I'm not entirely sure because it's a four there, yeah. book adventure path. 
And I was wondering if, um, do you have a sense of, would that be an adventure that people could run before Ruby Phoenix, even though there's some overlap in levels there? Uh, or how would that work out? Yeah, you, there is a little bit of an overlap in level and also it does take place in the past. Uh, it's kind of one of the first adventures we have not in our timeline quite exactly. But I think, and certainly not to get too ahead of myself with that uh, thing because it's still publishing. Um, one of the things that the four book structure kind of did was it allowed for a different sort of story, kind of storytelling structure. It's kind of broadly er, er, broadly based on like Kisho Tenkets, which is kind of like a, a different kind of narrative format um, that shows up a lot in some older Japanese literature, Chinese literature, that sort of thing. It does mean that there's kind of an, an event in book three that uh, you might that um, might be a good place where if you want to kind of because book three ends at tenth level, it might be a place where you maybe divert your thing where you say instead of going to the fourth book you might uh, maybe fudge the timeline a little bit, but you might say like and this might be a good time to go uh, check out the qualifier on Bonmu, maybe think about entering the tournament if that's what you want to do. I'm sure if you want to play it through like uh, I got a chance to look through it this morning. It is very cool. Um, you can maybe do that and maybe say that uh, maybe you skip the qualifier and go straight to the tournament. I think there's a lot of ways that you could kind of get that in there if what uh, your players want to do is kind of get a 1 to 20 TN shot adventure. Cool. I, that, that's really interesting. Do you have, I guess before even Season of Ghost came out, did you have an adventure path that you kind of generally recommend it for people maybe looking to do a, a 1 to 20 uh, that would pre be a prelude to Fist of the Ruby Phoenix? Anything that you liked in particular? I mean, I imagine with the setup of, you know, entering this tournament, a lot of adventures kind of work. Um, but was there one in particular that you liked to run before this? Well, when we, I mean, when we put this out, this was the first time we were kind of doing these three-parters and we prefaced this with uh, Abomination Vaults. And so we kind of had the, hey, solving this big mystery, uh, you know, off in Absalom might catch the notice of the tournament organizers. And that's how you get, you know, your your tournament invitation. But, uh, you know, you're heroes if, when you're playing Pathfinder. And so I think kind of uh, solving any sort of local, you know, monster attack or uh, evil wizard or that kind of thing might be, you know, that takes place up until about 10th level might is very easy to spin into thing of, you know, um, word of your deeds has reached uh, this global tournament happening over here. And, you know, not many of the teams are that it's very much was meant to not just be kind of the Asia AP. It was meant to be like the Olympics. So there are teams from, you know, from the Mwangi Expanse, from Arcadia, from the lands of the Lunar King. And so it makes sense to kind of wherever your group is coming from, it's very easy to get one of those kind of tournament invitations. I don't know if they're quite the golden tickets or Smash Bros invites, but very similar kind of vibe going on. That's cool. And I did want to ask you one last thing, because I, having written some high level adventures in my short little writing career, I know that they were a particular challenge. And this was an adventure that goes from 18 to 20. And I wondered <laughs> if your thoughts on writing these near God level adventures to make them a challenge for these characters and what your thoughts on that were. Yeah, I mean, thankfully, I think that like Pathfinder really shines at high level. I think that, you know, the math still math still holds up um, and you get all these very cool abilities. Uh, so in some ways, writing in high level encounters is a lot of fun because you can just kind of do whatever, whatever you want. I mean, I don't know. They're, they're 20th level. Uh, sure. Are they fighting a ghost in uh, kind of a memory scape? And there's like unlimited legendary weapons just like lying around you can pick up and and like shoot at people, sure. I'm like, yeah, that sounds cool. I'm gonna do that. Um, but of course, like the the PCs can do quite a lot. But I think as long as you are taking like what their challenges are uh, and scaling them up at the same time, you know, the PCs are never the strongest people in the entire universe. There's there's always a bigger fish. There's always, you know, a literal kaiju or you know, a several thousand year old martial arts master or a demi plane full of ghosts. That kind of thing. Um, and I think that certainly if you just, there are some like kind of disruptive abilities, you know, like people turning into 
you know, people phasing through objects or teleporting long distances. And here we're just like, yeah, cool. Uh, if they want to teleport back to Goka to go shopping, that sounds great. They can do that. Cool. Um, but for the most part, I actually thought it was uh, really fun to just kind of make these really over the top uh, encounters at the end. You know, you have kaiju attacking and you have people throwing planets and that sort of thing. So it's good fun. You don't have to hold back. <laughs> Uh, that's awesome. Um, finally, just uh, if folks want to follow along with what you're doing, some of the exciting new projects coming down the pike, what's the best place for folks to find you? Um, I am both on Twitter and I'm on Blue Sky as James Case. Uh, otherwise, the projects we have coming along, uh, the remaster books are still, you know, we're still working to get together a Monster Core uh, in the spring in G and Player Core 2 next summer. I'm also the project lead for Hell of the Wild, uh, which we're gonna start talking about a lot more soon. And of course, the two Tansha books, uh, which will be coming out next year. Exciting. Well, James, thank you so much for coming and talking to us today. I really appreciate it. And I'm excited to have you back again soon, when, maybe when those no Tianja books come out. Yeah, sounds great. Good talking to you. Thank you again to James for joining us today. Fists of the Ruby Phoenix Martial Arts Masters is available now for between 70 and 80 bucks. Let me know what you think about it in the comments section down below. And if you like to play as a proper genie in your adventures, be sure to pick up Rare Ancestry's Ifrit Genies over at Pathfinder Infinite. That would make your Ruby Phoenix games quite interesting, I promise you that. And check out the Hit Point Press site now for their Black Friday deals while supplies last, including their animated 5e reference cards. And you can join me live on Wednesday, November 29th for our next game of Blood on the Clock Tower over at twitch.tv slash thegallantgoblin. If you haven't seen our first game yet, I think it is really fun. You can check out that link up above in the corner right there. And uh, my friends and I are going to be going on Twitch more often, I think, in the coming months. So come and follow us there if you'd like to just hang out and shout with me sometime. And don't forget about our Black Friday sale going on now to get 20% off your order at heroplush.com. Just use the code GOBBLEGOBLIN. I told you there was a lot of stuff to cover today. You can also join me on social media at one of these sites over here. And until I see you again, stay safe, have fun, love each other. For my American audience, have a wonderful Thanksgiving, and I will see you next time at the Gallant Goblin.